we love stories, then that is and has been a universal truth that has spanned across all nations and all times. Our ancestors shared and received stories at first in oral form, and people would gather and sit wide-eyed in amazement as a talented storyteller would recount a tale of grandeur. Then we evolved into the production of plays and written stories, and nowadays, I mean, if we're truly being honest, most of us spend our evenings and free times uh, immersing ourselves into the stories that are played out for us on TV or in the movies. Or if you happen to be a bookworm, then you still consume your stories in written form. However, this shouldn't surprise us, since God created us to be drawn towards stories. So much so that one of the main ways in which Jesus taught was through parables, which are simply stories that contain a profound truth and teaching. Now, I think that most of us can also agree that some of our favorite stories are those where there is a huge twist at the end. But it's one where if we had been paying attention, all of the signs pointed to it happening. For example, but, but we just didn't catch it. Uh, but for example, most of us simply thought that in the movie The Sixth Sense, and if you haven't seen it by now, then, well, spoiler alert, but it's been several years. So, uh, but that being said, it, we all thought that was more probable that Bruce Willis's wife simply was going on for years without speaking to him, even on their anniversary dinner. This is despite the fact that we totally saw him get shot in the beginning of the film. Yet, once we see the fulfillment of everything, we can't help but to want to watch it all over from the beginning so that we can then see the story played out, but this time with all of the cards on the table. So, why do I bring this up? Well, in today's passage that we're going to be studying, we're going to see one of the many prophecies from Isaiah that Jesus is fulfilling firsthand. However, the people in Isaiah's day, they really had no clue what exactly all of the Isaiah's messianic prophecies really meant and would look like. And even the vast majority of those living in Jesus' day, they failed to comprehend that it was Jesus who was actually the one fulfilling all of the prophecies. It wasn't until Jesus' resurrection, though, that everyone got that light bulb moment of realization of who Jesus is and what his true mission was. At this point, the disciples and the Israelites, who were fully versed in the Old Testament, they were then now able to go back and see Jesus depicted all throughout the Old Testament in the same way that we can see the foreshadowed end all throughout the sixth sense when we watch it for the second time. So, that's a one such example of this is going to be found in the passage that we're exploring today, which is specifically Matthew 12, 15 to 21, where Matthew is able to see, as we should, that what Jesus is doing and who he is, is fulfilling the prophecy that is recorded in Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Now, it can be so easy as, for us to just simply read this passage and just glance over it or be like, well, wow, that's pretty cool, um, and not really see this passage in the all-powerful reality that it gives us for the earth-shattering reality that it really is. So today, I want to explore this passage with you and extract everything that it has for us. So that said, the passage reads, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from here, and many followed him. And he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will have hope. So before we dive into our main study here, context is key as always. So let's just start by painting the picture of the reality of the culture and mindset of Jesus's time. Now, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the events in Matthew's gospel, they are taking place during the Roman occupation of Judea. Once again, the Israelites were being oppressed and as such, they longed for and anticipated a messianic figure who would liberate them from their Roman occupiers. Now, just as there are several Christians today who have their own notion of Christianity or Jesus, they how they read the Bible with a distorted lens so that they can then make it try to say what they want it to say and confirm their own view, viewpoints. Um, and prosperity gospel followers are one such example of that. Um, but so too were the Israelites in that day doing the exact same thing. And that led them to being unable or unwilling, which is by the case more likely, to see Jesus as the rightful Messiah and Son of God. 
Now, it's also important to point out the context that Jesus' ministry, it had gained quite a widespread attention, which drew massive crowds. Now, unfortunately, the majority of those crowds, they were simply composed of those who were really only interested in receiving some of the supernatural healing that Jesus was offering left and right. Now, despite the fact that that was the prominent motivation, uh, the Jewish people were eagerly anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. And these miracles that were performed by Jesus, along with the teachings that often accompanied them, they, they did fuel the speculation about his identity. So additionally, the passage that Matthew quotes from Isaiah that presents Jesus as the fulfillment of the servant of the Lord. And that being said, the Jewish audience at this time, they would have been intimately familiar with all of the messianic pro prophecies. And this quotation would have resonated with their expectations. Now, profoundly, the fact that the verse 21 mentions the Gentiles being given hope, that reflects the widening of God's redemption plan beyond Israel. Now, this idea of Gentile inclusion, it would have been a significant theological shift for the Israelites, and it would have challenged their traditional Jewish expectations. However, as we're going to dive into a bit later, we're going to see that the mission of God to have all people of all nations come into a relationship with him, it's actually something that we see recorded as early as Genesis. So, that said, let's now talk about the beginning of this passage, which says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. So the question that we first need to ask is, well, what exactly was Jesus aware of? Well, if you happen to catch the last video where we stated the passage that came right before this, which this is part, probably about 60 or so of a verse-by-verse -verse series that we've been doing through Matthew, um, the last sentence of that passage and the information that we're given right before this verse is that the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So this is what Jesus was withdrawing for. However, while this is the specific reason that he withdraws in this incident, this is something that he would do repeatedly, but not for his safety. Instead, he would withdraw so that he could spend personal time in communion with his father, or to move on to another town where he knew that his mission was leading him to. So, for example, in Luke 5.16, we find a similar instance where Jesus withdraws to, a de to desolate places to pray. And this recurring theme, it really underscores the significance of solitude and communion with God in the life of our Savior. In Mark 1.35, after a day of healing and preaching, Jesus rises early to withdraw to a quiet place for prayer, which emphasizes the rhythm of withdrawal and engagement in his ministry. That said, though, the, this uh, countercultural nature of Jesus' withdrawal, uh, and withdrawals, I should say, it challenges the prevalent trends in modern ministry. Um, in an era where the size of the audience is often equated with success, Jesus' deliberate retreat stands as a stark reminder that true impact is not measured by the magnitude of the crowd, but by the fidelity to the Father's will. So on that point, for those of us that are in ministry, it does become a balance in caring about the numbers. On one hand, when I started this channel, I began with a core driving thought that as long as what I'm doing helps at least one person come to accept Jesus or even grow closer to God, then all of the hours of studying, preparing, editing, and so on would be more than worth it. However, on the other hand, every person that we bring to Christ or that, that we help with their sanctification process is one more soldier in Christ's army or at least a better equipped one. And that sounds like a win in my books. The problem, though, comes when pastors care more about the numbers of attendees, views, and subscribers than the percentage of those who actually experience real-life change and become disciples who make other disciples. So, that said, while Jesus was withdrawn from where he was, there is still a crowd that follows him. And we read that Jesus heals them all. Now, while we can't know for certain just how many the many are that is mentioned, it is likely that this is a decent amount of people since that's the attraction and pull that his earthly ministry had. The amazing thing is, though, that Jesus heals them all. He doesn't turn anyone away or refuse them, nor was he incapable of healing any sort of ailment, disease, or infirmity that came to him with the faith and desperate hope to be made whole. Now, this is a fact that we often just glance over as we read our Bible, especially for probably considering how many times it is presented to us. Now, that being said, while each of these incidents, it only takes a short sentence to describe this, for each and every person who encountered Jesus that day, this was an earth-shattering, life-defining moment that each of them could easily write a whole book about. 
However, Jesus, still not wanting to stir up the hornet's nest too much just yet, he continues to ask those who are healed to not tell anyone. So that said, the passage tells us that this was all, all these actions, the withdrawing to avoid a quarrel, healing all who came, which quite likely probably did include some Roman Gentiles, um, and asking them not to tell anyone about what had happened just yet, which once again was simply to avoid a quarrel before the time appointed. All of this was to fulfill what was written in Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Here we see a profound prophetic passage that is often recognized for its messianic implications and its fulfillment in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. This text serves as a window into the divine plan, revealing the characteristics and missions of the mission of the anticipated Messiah. As we delve into these verses, it is crucial to discern the nuanced details that align with the New Testament narrative, which affirm Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. The passage opens with a proclamation. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The mention of the servant is significant, emphasizing a chosen and anointed individual who will carry out a divine mission. Now, this aligns with all of the gospel narratives where we see Jesus repeatedly being identified as the servant of the Lord, fulfilling the Father's will. We also see the very reality of this played out at the start of Jesus' ministry, when he goes to John the baptizer and gets baptized. And when Jesus comes out of the water, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and descends upon him like a dove, and then God the Father is audibly heard, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. This divine anointing it signifies the empowerment of Jesus for the redemptive task ahead, reinforcing the connection between Isaiah's prophecy and its realization in the life of Christ. The mission of the servant is illuminated in Isaiah 42.1, stating that he will bring forth justice to the nations. This echoes Jesus' ministry characterized by preaching, healing, and restoring justice. Matthew, quoting Isaiah, affirms that Jesus will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, which highlights the universal scope of the Messiah's mission. However, in actuality, this mission, like I said, it's as old as Genesis. It simply has an increased focus in detail now. Now, I could spend a whole other video or possibly even a series of videos on this, uh, but I will just point out that th the first of the promises that we can see for the ultimate mission has always been to include Gentiles. So if we turn to Genesis 12, 2 to 3, God is making a covenant with Abram. And yes, this is before God changed his name to Abraham. And the passage reads, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and, it, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, there are technically seven promises within that passage. But the one that I want to focus on here is the last one, which is that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now note that it doesn't say that in him all the Israelites will be blessed. No, it says that all the families of the earth will be. So what that blessing was, now that would remain shrouded in a mystery for Abram as God continued to speak to his people through Moses and then the prophets, where that mystery then begins to get clearer and clearer with each revelation that points to a Messiah who is clearly Jesus, who would come to bring justice to the world. However, the point that I'm trying to show is that while the Israelites, they certainly, without a doubt, they've always been God's chosen people. The mission of God to be Lord and Savior of all to believe and accept, in, in, and accept him, how, that, however, has been a part of God's plan since the beginning. So, as I said, the subsequent verses, they further show us what sh we should expect from the Messiah and how he will carry out his mission. Isaiah 42, 2-3 <clears throat> to be depict a gentle and compassionate approach. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. This resonates with Jesus' ministry as portrayed in the Gospels. That said, some have tried to argue that this passage doesn't fully portray Jesus, especially the part where it says that he won't cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Therefore, I just want to address this real quick um, in case you do encounter someone who makes such a claim so that you are then equipped to give a rebuttal. Or, if we're being honest, you might feel like such a claim is warranted yourself. And then I can hopefully clear that up for you. 
And if it doesn't, please feel free to uh, leave a question in the comments. Um, that said, though, this doesn't mean that Jesus never spoke loudly or in the streets for that matter. He obviously did since he was preaching and teaching wherever he went. And in the time before microphones and PA systems, you pre pretty much had to speak loudly so that a crowd could hear you. And wherever Jesus preached, there was always a crowd. So he had to speak loudly. Jesus, he also cried aloud when he was nailed onto the cross and cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That statement there is a whole other topic to discuss, but suffice it to say that this cry in particular, it was a cry to God his father, not to the people in the streets. So to clear this all up, the passage in Isaiah, it refers to Jesus's gentle, lowly heart and actions. Jesus, he didn't make his way or fulfill his mission by bluster and loud, overwhelming talk, but instead by the spirit of God being upon him. He then tried to achieve his mission by inserting himself into man-made institutions of politics and religious hierarchy. Instead, he went around Israel and showed compassion for all and healed them. And then he connected that physical healing to the true spiritual healing that is vastly more important that only he can provide. So the next part of the passage says that a bruised reed he will not break. And this references the gentle character of Jesus. Now, there's hardly a more frail or fragile object than a bruised and broken reed that has been lashed by the wind or buffeted by turbulent waters. This is, of course, just an analogy, though, and it's not saying that Jesus, the anticipated Messiah, wouldn't step on or break an actual reed, brood, bruised or not, whether intentionally or by accident. Um, the bruised reeds, they refer to us. After all, what are we but fragile reeds that are exposed to a plethora of dangers, physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Due to this, we can easily find ourselves bruised, feeling as though the next breeze that comes our way will be our undoing and simply wipe us out. The good news, though, is that Jesus sees the value in a bruised reed, even when no one else can. And not only does he see the value, he delights in caring for it, healing it, and restoring it to glory. So, the reed, it refers to our emotional and physical state. But the passage also mentions that, that a smoldering wick he will not quench. This refers to our spiritual state, which is even more important. And honestly, this part right here, it should give us much comfort for our times and the times in our lives when we simply feel that our spiritual state is in a dry spill. Yes, I mean, most of us call ourselves Christians, or I'm at least assuming that that is true for the majority of those of who are watching my channel. Um, and if you don't identify with one and you're still watching this channel, then amen. Glad you're here. Um, but if we are being honest, there are some times that we can feel extremely ashamed of how dimly our light burns. I can feel as though there's far more smoke than there is actual fire, a shamefully lacking prayer life, receding back into sin, so much depression and feeling extremely discouraged. The good news, though, is that even we, when we are in that state, Jesus, he will not quench it and let it die, regardless of however close to extinguished it might seem. Instead, the servant will gently blow on that smoking wick, fanning it into flame again. While others might find a smoldering wick worthless, Jesus knows that it's valuable for what it can be when it's refreshed with oil. What we need is to be drenched in oil by Jesus, and with a constant supply coming as we are filled with that Holy Spirit. So this brings up a concept that I brought up before, where we've encountered the passage earlier in Matthew about your eyes being the lamp of the body. Now, that said, if I asked you to think of a lamp now, you'd probably imagine something that you plug into an electrical source that you can then turn on and off with the switch. Um, back in Jesus' day, though, that wasn't the case. Instead, it was a vessel that contains oil. And when we consider that this is the type of lamp that Jesus is referring to, then we, just, we can see just how fitting that is as an analogy for us. Oil is something that is both mentioned and used all throughout the Bible for a couple different reasons, but the most prominent of them was for anointing, which is where oil was rubbed on or poured on a person's head and or body. This was a fairly common practice in Jewish custom, although it was especially prominent for, prominent for those who were about to take either the office of prophet, priest, or king. Now, while there are several examples of this, for time's sake, I'm just going to mention two, the first of which being Exodus 30, 30 to 32. And this describes the special anointing oil that was used for Aaron and his descendants to concentrate them, consecrate them for priestly work, it, which says, and you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve as priests to me. 
Furthermore, you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. The other example that I want to, want to mention comes from 1 Samuel 16, 13, which reads, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Additionally, even material objects that were used for worship and offerings, they were anointed with oil as well. As it is, as it is described in Exodus 30, 24 to 28, and 500 of Cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil, and you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer, and it shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its utensils, and the lampstand, and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offerings, with all its utensils, and the basin, and its stand. Now, the Bible, it also teaches us that the anointing of oil was also practiced to help heal others. In Mark 6, 13, it says, And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And additionally, in James 5, 14, it says, Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, James, are you telling me all this stuff about oil to pitch me some sort of essential oils or something? And if that's you, then you can put yourself at ease um, because no, that is not the case at all. Um, I, I'm not asking you to buy anything. However, I do want you to have the only essential oil that you will ever need, which is the Holy Spirit. You see, the, anoint, the, the anointing of oil, it was symbolic of the spiritual anointing of the Holy Spirit. So keeping that in mind, let's now take a look at Psalm 23 which is my personal favorite of all the Psalms. And I won't read the whole thing for time's sake, but I do want to focus on two lines in it, which says, the Lord is my shepherd and he anoints my head with oil. Now I could easily do a whole video on that concept alone. And I did go into it in much further detail in um, that video um, about the lamp being, the eye being the lamp of your body. Um, but that being said, all throughout the Bible, we find the analogy of us being sheep and the Lord being our shepherd. And people during the time of this sermon, they would have fully appreciated and understood it's an, this is analogy because they would have almost certainly at least known a shepherd or two if they weren't a shepherd themselves. Um, now, nowadays, that's typically not the case. I mean, I don't know about you, but I personally don't know any shepherds myself other than Jesus. Um, of course, though, there is no shepherd quite like Jesus. And thankfully so. Um, but however, while all shepherds had a relationship with their flock and would care for and provide for them, most weren't willing to lay down their lives for their flock. But as John 10, 11 tells us, that is exactly what Jesus does for us. So that being said, to bring it all back, back full circle, despite how close to extinction the flame is within us, Jesus, he longs to anoint you with oil and to fill you with the Holy Spirit, turning you into a blazing fire that can be seen from miles away that points everyone to God. After all, if that lamp inside you has only a little bit of oil, that, that, that blaze is going to be very, very minimal. We need it to be fully full, right? And that's only by the Holy Spirit anointing you through the power of Jesus. So while the reed can be bruised and the wick smolder, the good news is that that implies a positive alternative. Jesus, he can mend the bruised reed and ignite the smoldering wick. You simply have to ask. And with that, we will end today's study. Now, that being said, I should be doing a pre live preaching event here next week that I will put out once I get the footage from. Um, and I'm going to be touching on all the super easy softball topics that all preachers love to cover. To, you know, race, politics, denominations, all that stuff. Uh, so make sure to be on the lookout for that one. Um, that said, my second book should be out within the next few weeks as well, um, which is a 12-week study on Luke. And while you can tackle that book individually, it is really designed for a group setting. Um, lastly, though, before I wrap us up in prayer, I do want to highlight that I have a linked a selected worship song in the description below that I highly, highly encourage you to put on directly after this video and do some personal prayer time and then worship your heart out. Uh, but with that, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much um, for who you are and for whose we are, Lord. Lord, um, for anyone that um, has been drawn to this channel, Lord, I, I just ask that you bless them. Um, but more importantly, Lord, if any of them that are listening to this, they feel 
like a bruised reed, Lord. They, they've just um, gone through a really trying physical or emotional time, Lord. Um, Lord, we just ask that you mend them, Lord. Mend, mend them from the inside out, Lord, um, as only you can do. Um, and Lord, for any of us that have been, any viewers that, that have been uh, feeling like a smoldering wick, like their flame is just on the last little legs of about to be going out. Um, they feel like they're in that dry spell, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you completely fill them with the Holy Spirit. Rejuvenate them, Lord. Give them a fresh, fresh fire. And we pray all of this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. With that, look forward to seeing you in the next video. God bless and keep you.